So I'm going to talk completely about cancer. And as I've said, I'm an oncologist. For one day of the week, I treat cancer patients. And I treat patients badly. What I mean by that is that, by and large, in oncology, if you have a cancer diagnosed, for every 10 patients I see, we treat them all the same. And that flies in the face of what we know, which is that every cancer patient is different, and every cancer is different. And genomics is going to give us for the first time, an unparalleled glimpse into how, for the first time, we could take a patient in the clinic, and I'm going to show you a patient in, who's been to the clinic and what we can do. I could take a patient, we can begin to identify how we can really personalize cancer medicine, that holy grail for the last decade. And of course, the reason for cancer and the promise of genomes is underpinned by what a problem it's going to be. So this is what we die of in 2010. In the red circle is cardiovascular disease, heart disease. But that's going to decrease because we're now smoking less. This little green circle at the bottom is cancer, and cancer is creeping up. It's number two at the moment, but very soon, within the decade, cancer will be the number one killer in the UK and in the Western world. And what we know is that across cancers, they behave differently. Each of these circles is a cancer type. The size of the circle is how much funding they get across the EU. On the y-axis is how common the cancer is, and on the dreadful x-axis is how long people survive over five years. So breast cancer gets lots of funding. People do pretty well. Lung cancer, very common, abysmal survival. Pancreas, esophagus, a huge number of cancers are well below the 50% survival rate. Most cancers we don't treat very well. Huge amount of work to do. But the promise is this, cancer is essentially a genetic disease. Underpinning all of what we see in the clinic is changes going from left to right at the level of the chromosome, at the level of individual nucleotides or bases being mutated, or at the level of the chromosomes, where you can gain or lose copies of chromosomes. Ultimately, this drives most of what we see as cancer. And it doesn't just drive how we get cancers, it potentially drives how cancers are going to respond to treatment. And if we could decipher that, then we would, in the patient setting, have the first time the ability to personalize cancer treatment. And we can do that. This is a MySeq. It's a next generation sequencing machine. This is what you can put somebody's DNA into, and within a couple of days, you will have that complete cancer code. Now, that's only the beginning, because the interpretation of it's going to be the tricky bit. But if we can do that, we can begin to do this. And this is a slide from 2005. This is a lung cancer patient in Boston who was treated with an AstraZeneca drug called Jafitinib. Now, Jafitinib is, targets a particular protein that's present on the surface of cancer cells. AstraZeneca advised this drug about seven years ago, and they just gave it to all lung cancer patients. No personalization, lung cancer, you got the drug. And what they saw was that in a small number of patients, the cancer went from this CT scan, and this is a scan of somebody's chest. The bit on the black is normal lung. The white bit on the other side should be black, and it's essentially white because it's completely filled with cancer. And that solid cancer in the hemithorax, after only six weeks of treatment, went from the left to the right. That's unprecedented in solid tumors. Six weeks of treatment, the cancer went from that to that. And of course, what transpired retrospectively was that the patients who responded, and it was only about 10% of the patients, but 1,500 patients treated, the 10% who responded, they all had a mutation in a gene called EGFR, which the drug targets. So, of course, AstraZeneca, this was the original trial. $44 million for a trial where the blue line is lung cancer patients who got a placebo, and the red line is this new drug. And we joke in oncology that if you can fit a laser point in between the lines, a drug works. That's how bad our treatments are at the moment. But by and large, you and I would agree, this treatment didn't work very well. So $44 million, 1,500 patients, really no difference. But what they found was that if you looked within that red line, the patients who are treated, and this is, sur this is survival over 16 months, if you look within that red line, which doesn't look very good, the patients within that red line whose cancers had an EGFR mutation, their response rate was about 40%. And if you didn't have the mutation, response rate was about 4%. So a tenfold change in your likelihood of responding to a drug based upon sequencing a single gene in your cancer. So, of course, AstraZeneca aren't stupid. This is the next trial I did about four years later. And now they said, well, let's now look at those EGFR mutated positive lung cancer patients. And now we'll either give them standard chemo, which is the lower curve, or gefitinib, which is the higher curve. And you can see there's a huge shift in difference. Interestingly, 
You don't cure patients. The lines do eventually meet. Patients live longer, but eventually cancer comes back, and that's kind of the twist in the tale. But the first time, there was a glimmer of evidence that if you could genotype pe people's cancers and identify that 10% of the population and give them the right drug, you would dramatically shift survival. And what we're beginning to think about is how we do this, how we go from a cancer where I've generally this is blue circles. Can we treat patients more effectively? The cancer shrinks, but knowing the cancer will probably come back. How do we begin to do that in the clinic? And if in the Sanger Institute we do two things, we sequence cancers to look at that code, and then once we find the mutations, then we have to ask ourselves, what do the mutations mean? Are there any other each of our stories? So for the interpretation, we look at large biological models. And Mike Stratton asked me to put out the mission statement. I'm not sure if the Crick has a mission statement, but this is our mission statement. It's not a bad one. The first time I saw this, it looked a little bit cheesy. But essentially, we use genome sequences to advance understanding of the biology of humans and pathogens in order to improve human health. It's a very simple statement, but that's pretty much what we want to do, is we want to take genomes, which are horribly complex. We want to take that code from cancers and actually improve how patients survive and live. I'm going to tell you about a real patient, because this, this is not science fiction. This is a man who presented to Addenbrooke's just before Christmas last year. He was a tree surgeon. He was 42 years old. He'd come to the attention of the clinicians about two years prior to that in 2010. He had a melanoma in his leg, which is pictured below. He had it excised by the plastic surgeons. He didn't need any further treatment. And his CT scan at that point was clear. So this was a chap, melanoma in 2010, excised, clear, went home. Unfortunately, October last year, he began to develop night sweats. He was losing weight. He was getting more tired. He couldn't get to work all the time. And eventually, he went to his GP. Like most men, he didn't present for about three months. He sort of shrugged it off. Went to his GP. GP felt an enlarged gland in his groin, sent him up to Addenbrooke's, and he had a CT scan, whole body scan. And unfortunately, he had multiple cancer showing up. His melanoma had come back. The circle is essentially around a large cancer deposit in his abdomen, and he had many, many other deposits. The circle here in his lung, he had lung metastases, and on the right he had another metastasis under his chest while in his skin. He was essentially riddled with metastatic disease. But what you can do, of course, is you can ask a friendly plastic surgeon now to freeze up the skin, which we did, and we took out a large metastatic lesion about the size of a golf ball. And it was almost pitch black because melanomas are heavily pigmented. And of course, now you can do two things. And you can sequence, but you can also look at the cells. And this is this gentleman's genome. When you think about cancer and cancer being genetic, this is a cancer genome. And this is this gentleman's melanoma genome. And this is a visualization of all of the different aspects of what we talk about in genomics. We have the chromosomes from 1 all the way around to 22. We picture the deletions, insertions, parts of the gene which have been removed or inserted to make the cancer more fit. We can look at what we call coding substitutions. An A becomes a T or a C or a G, and that gives the cancer some increased fitness to survive. We can look at copy number, the chromosomes. Do you gain some? Do you lose some? Because that uh, improves the cancer's fitness to survive. And we can look at what we call rearrangements. Chromosomes shatter and break apart. And when they're stuck back together, that quite often gives the cancer some survival advantage. And of course, in this gentleman, I've just highlighted here, this gentleman had a particular mutation in a gene called BRAF. And about half of all melanoma patients have a mutation in that gene. And if they have that mutation, they have a particular response. Now, this survival, and you'll see many of these survival curves, is essentially how we plot how a drug works. If you're on the vertical red line, that means you die straight away. That's not good. And if you're on the horizontal line, you got, you're a complete cure. We never see that. So this is the response you get if you understand the genomics of cancer. BRAF mutant melanoma, treated with a BRAF inhibitor. After only 15 weeks of treatment, you go from that to that. That's exactly what we saw. This is this gentleman's scan from October. You can see in the red circle the large cancer deposit. And it shrank to about half the size after eight weeks of treatment with a combination treatment underpinned by the sequencing, the genetics, and treating it with the appropriate treatment. Now, you can do something else today as well. 
today as we sit here, as well as sequencing the cancer and finding that information out, you can actually take a patient's cancer cells and you can grow them in the laboratory. So this, this gentleman's melanoma cells are growing essentially in a three-dimensional jelly. And of course, what you can do in the laboratory that you can't do in a patient, because one can imagine if I had a patient sitting in front of him and I wanted to know what treatment to give them, I would love to be able to split that patient into 50 different people and give them 50 different drugs and actually see which one works. But of course, we can't do that in the clinic. But because we've got this patient's cells sitting there, we can actually do that in the laboratory. So this patient's melanoma cancer cells, happily growing in a kind of jelly structure. If you treat them with a BRAF inhibitor, the very drug the patient got that he responded to, the cells respond. But of course, what you can do now is you can treat these cells with 50 different drugs, or 100 or 1,000. So this is this gentleman's melanoma cells while the patient's alive getting the treatment. And we tested his cells with 48 different drugs. And this traffic light system basically means green, the drug didn't work. Orange, the drug worked. So his cells respond to the two drugs he got in the clinic. Good. But his cells also respond to an mTORC inhibitor, a CHIC1, CHIC2 inhibitor. Interesting glimpses into what we can learn from biologically testing cells and using them in the clinic. Now the problem here in the sting in the tail is that that's wonderful. We get to the middle bit, we treat the patient more effectively, but clinical experience dictates that everyone develops resistance. Cancer is a very slippery entity, and in a purely almost Darwinian fashion, even one cancer cell in a population of a billion, it's resistant, will become a new dominant clone. And that's invariably what happens, and it is happening in all of these patients as they develop resistance, but there's a huge push now towards simply rebiopsying and characterizing the cancer. I'm going to bring in some heavy-duty science now, which my colleagues haven't done, but I think you're ready for it. So if we wanted to, if we want to understand what drives resistance, because the question now is patients are going to start coming back to the clinic, they'll have responded initially to the drug. While they're on the drug, the cancer will start getting worse doesn't work anymore, can we understand why and can that point us towards a second line treatment? You can take a system whereby you can take a cancer cell which is a blue stylized cartoon and you can use things called transposons and transposons are essentially entities from the insect and plant kingdom which, which are able to jump around the genome. So imagine those little bits of DNA, you put them into a cell, they jump around your genome, in this case the cancer genome, and they just randomly insert places. Most places they insert into they don't do anything but occasionally they'll insert into a gene that actually does something that will turn a gene on or off. And so essentially you can activate these, these little transposons jump around, they'll activate a gene and turn it on in a very significant way in the cancer cell, and that gene on effect can happen in about 10 million cells. Now you've got the cancer cells, you can ask, well okay, if we do that in 10 million cancer cells, we've randomly genome-wide turned every single gene sort of on and off, we can now add any drug we want and ask what have they now become resistant to and what's driving that? And so you can take melanoma cells from the patient. We can do what we call a transfection. We do this genetic screen. We do what we call a mobilization. You add your drug of interest. It can be any drug at all, any drug your patient's getting in the clinic. And then you essentially add your drug. And the cells that survive must be resistant. And they're resistant because we have genetically engineered our defect. And it may be the same defect that the cancer in the clinic is going to develop itself. This isn't science fiction, this is the same patient's melanoma cells, that tree surgeon, those are his cells with a MEK inhibitor, which is a class of drugs we use. If you don't do this system, the cells die. If you activate the system, you get drug-resistant colonies forming. And those melanoma cells, we have made them resistant through a genetic screen. And we can now sequence and find out where those transposons have landed and find out or develop a list of all the potential means by which cancers can become resistant to any drug at all. It's a red light here, so I'm kind of running out of time, but... You cracked the code. <laughs> <laughs> we can read the code, we can't interpret it yet. Uh, but I would argue there's huge opportunities. I, I think fundamentally, even as an oncologist, we will dramatically change how we treat cancer patients. I think we will begin to realize that whenever we see 10 lung cancer patients, we need to treat them with 10 different treatments. I'm going to argue as well that there's a unique opportunity in the UK to create a hub of excellence. The UK, compared to any other country in the world, has a very special healthcare system and the ability to match all of this genomic data with clinical data. 
And if we could do that, if we could sequence every single cancer patient, all 300,000 cancer patients in England, if we could sequence all of those, and we could match that genomic data with their outcome, their survival, and their treatment response, that is a huge amount of data whereby we will find the signatures of not only how we treat people more effectively, but which patients we shouldn't treat. And that's probably going to be as important. And there are challenges. There are ethical challenges about how we begin to manage uh, finding out things within our normal DNA as part of this process that aren't part of a personal genome. There's no such thing as a personal genome. We share our genome with our family. And as part of this journey into cancer genome sequencing, we will find out things about our family's genome that may affect their future risk of things. And how do we manage that? These are challenges, but none of these are insurmountable. But huge opportunities as well. And I think really that the Crick is really going to be the forefront of this. It's a very, it's a fascinating model, the anarchy, putting people together, these bright young minds, and seeing what comes out. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done.